I'm really excited to be here to talk about uh, the marijuana issue, and it's you know clearly is an issue that is, um, you know, almost everybody has an opinion of. We half of America has tried marijuana at least once in their lives, in their lives, and so I think a lot of people's opinion are formed by personal experience rather than the the data, and so I'm going to try and talk today about the data, and it's a pretty long presentation, which I'm going to go very quickly over. I, I don't know if we have some ex-New Yorkers in here. So I know Florida has a lot of New Yorkers. You'll be able to, I think, understand how fast I'm, I'm talking. Um, but if I'm speaking too fast, I'm sorry in advance, and we'll, we'll make sure to have the video, and we'll have this presentation available to any, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about national drug policy, current trends, get into seven myths, and then get into Colorado and Washington and where we are going with legalization. I'm going to touch very briefly on the Florida experience as well with uh, this. Everything I'm talking about about today is uh, fully cited in my recent book called Reefer Sanity. We don't have copies here today, unfortunately, but um, almost every sentence is cited with a peer-reviewed study, because again, it's important that we talk about the evidence um, and that we draw from what science has to say. I just want to um, place where we are right now. It's just interesting because there's so much discussion about marijuana, uh, as, which is an illegal drug, and I just think it's important to look at it in comparison to our legal drugs, um, just to have that perspective. And of course, we know that uh, about 50 to 60 percent of Americans regularly drink. This is the percentage of Americans that regularly use drugs. Um, What's interesting to me is not so much the alcohol number, but really the tobacco number, because we know that there's been re huge reductions. What a public health success that tobacco efforts have been in the last 15 years, such a change in our society. I mean, I don't even know where you can go smoke now for f like freely. I mean, you know, it's banned in most public places, even in private. I, I guarantee you'll have a relative uh, living with you that doesn't want you to smoke in, in your own home unless you so unless you really live alone in a home where that you own and you're not renting, it, they're very, it's very difficult to smoke these days. Even still, one in four Americans admit to smoking, um, which I think is interesting just given the fact that we have had a reduction. There's so much social stigma around uh, smoking, which I think is a good thing um, because it, it has you know, re reduced a lot of health and social problems. But even still, we have 27% of Americans using that legal drug. Then we go to marijuana, and this is, this is from uh, about two years ago, so I think it's a little low. Realistically, 7 to 8% of Americans regularly smoke marijuana. Um, and by the way, that's, of course, the most used illicit drug. I mean, if you look at all illicit drugs on the bottom, marijuana is 90% or 85% of all illicit drugs. And then we get to the pharmaceuticals and then, I mean, much, much lower levels of the other drugs, which, of course, obviously are extremely deadly, but um, those levels are just much, much lower. Uh, so marijuana, when we're talking about illegal drugs prevalence-wise, really takes the cake. But I think it's interesting that for every marijuana user, there are four people who smoke cigarettes and about six to seven people who drink. Um, it's just kind of an interesting divide to look at that. So I'm going to get right into the myths um, and like I, like I said I would and then get into what's going on and some more on the policy side. I mean, the myth that I hear the most is that marijuana is harmless and non-addictive. Um, last night it was said at the debate, uh, I mean, it, you know, the, the issue of the addictiveness of marijuana seems to be such a controversy in the public's eye. Ironically, in the eye of science, there is no controversy. I mean, you would be laughed out of any scientific room or discussion if you were to say that marijuana is not addictive. Um, we know that one in 10 or one in 11 adults who try marijuana after age 25 will become addicted at some point in their life. The more interesting part of this is the fact that it's really one in six kids who try marijuana will at some point in their life become addicted to it. Um, why is that? Well, we know that the brain up until age 25 is essentially under construction. Okay, Your brain is figuring out who it's going to be for the rest of its life from you know, conception to about your mid 20s. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you learn a if you learned a second language, you probably learned it before you were 10, or you know, before you were five would be even better. Um, if you learned how to swim or you love to bike ride, you probably learned when you were really young. You didn't wait till you're 40 or 50 to learn how to swim. That's because your brain is, is, is much, it's much easier to pick things up as it's forming and what we call priming and pruning and really becoming what it's gonna be, what, what it is today. And um, 
so we know that drugs, any drug, and actually I would say any event, anything that enters your brain or bloodstream, whether it's a substance or it could be a memory, um, has the ability to, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, hijack your brain. In other words, take it over, uh, whether you like it or not. So that's why childhood trauma is such a big deal, because that trauma can stay with that child for the rest of its life, much more probability that it would stay with that uh, person for the rest of its life than if you experience trauma as an adult. It's because it could stay with you. Drugs are the same thing. When drugs, any drug, any psychoactive drug, enters the brain and the bloodstream, essentially there's a potential, it doesn't happen to everybody, but there's a potential for that hijacking, I would say. So it, whether that's tobacco, cigarettes, whether that's heroin, whether it's phar uh, pharmaceuticals, whether it's marijuana. Um, whether alcohol also, obviously. Um, and so that's why I think we care a lot about if an, you know, adolescents and kids are using. That's why we focus um, on, on young people in this debate more than, more than anything else. You know, the other thing about the non-addictiveness we hear is that, well, you know, how could you be in treatment for using marijuana? I mean, that doesn't make people say, well, at the most, it's psychologically addictive. How many of you heard that term? Right, psychologically. Um, once again, to scientists, there is no such thing. So, I mean, addiction is addiction. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a mechanism, something that happens in your brain. It's not something that's psychological or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, an event, essentially, that happens. And there are symptoms that are physical or psychological, surely. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, God forbid if you've seen somebody in heroin withdrawal, that is a very physically acute, violent kind of addiction, whereas marijuana withdrawal, which is very real, is not going to usually be as physically uh, sort of acute and noticeable as it would be. But that doesn't mean that it's not addictive, right? Addiction is the, the idea of you experience withdrawal, cravings, you, it gets in the way of your work and your family life. You want to stop, but you can't. Um, those are all different sort of things that go into whether or not we sort of classify someone as addicted. And what's interesting is that when treatment centers report who are coming, you know, who are the people that are coming to their centers? What are they reporting as the reason, you know, I am here for treatment? I mean, Marijuana just beats the, every, every other drug. For adults, alcohol is the number one drug, followed by marijuana. For young people, marijuana is the most prevalent drug in treatment for not only, not only more than alcohol, but all drugs combined, including alcohol, which is very interesting. Um, now, we hear a lot about, well, this isn't as addictive as that, or heroin is worse, tobacco, alcohol, what's worse? That is, a, I think, a really unhelpful discussion, I have to say, to say what's worse, because th that's a really generalized question. The, the question is, what's worse when it comes to X, right? So what's worse when it comes to, I don't know, driving? What's worse when it comes to liver problems? What's worse when it comes to lung problems? What's worse when it comes to IQ? What's worse when it comes to employability and your likelihood of having an accident on a job? If you're a small business that person, that's a good thing to know. What's worse, whatever. You, you, we have to define what's worse. So I really dislike the current tide of the debate in this country of like, for example, alcohol is worse, so why is marijuana legal? I mean, it's sort of this, it's very strange to me. Um, in my mind, it's, and I'll get back to the alcohol, I'm gonna keep coming back to the alcohol and tobacco analogy. Those are our only two legal drugs that we can draw experience from, um, other than the pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, to me, when people say, well, alcohol's worse, so therefore we should make marijuana legal, to me, that's sort of like saying, my right arm is broken, so therefore I should break my left arm, right? It's like, I wanna be consistent. We would never say that. We would say we wanna try and fix our right arm. We don't wanna break our left arm. Um, the right arm's already broken, so there's not much we can do at this moment about it, but we can work on it or whatever. That to me makes a lot more sense for this alcohol versus marijuana analogy that I've been hearing a lot lately. Um, and I'm gonna get into more reasons why I think that analogy is really unhelpful. But when it comes to addiction, so if you're saying what's worse when it comes to addiction, well, we kind of have a relative scale to compare the addictive nature of different drugs drugs for young people. We also have it for adults, but I put it up for young people right now. If you're interested in the adult numbers, I can share with you. They're similar, but not exactly the same. Essentially, alcohol and marijuana are about as equally as addictive. Okay, That's basically what we have seen. Tobacco, cocaine, and heroin, not surprisingly, are the most addictive. What does that mean? It means the percentage of people who use the drug starting in adolescence who become addicted. That's what that means. So, uh, when, when, so when we say that 
20%, that's one in five. So that means one in five kids who try heroin will become addicted. Now, what's interesting is that you know, we hear all the time, well, most people who use marijuana are fine, and so why is this a big deal? Now, the issue is, yeah, most people who, and I'm not here to, to counter that. It is true. Most people who try marijuana, actually, they'll try once or twice and stop. The, the majority of the rest of the group will try three or four times and stop, and a very small percentage, I mean, 15% if you're starting when you're 16, will go on to addiction. So, you know, we don't serve anyone's interest when we kind of over-exaggerate the harms and whatever, but in my mind, one in six is a very high number. I mean, I don't see that as low. Uh, I get kids all the time when I discuss at high schools, they say one in six, they say, oh, Kevin, that's, that's nothing. That's worth it, right? That's worth, that's, those are good chances. That means five out of six uh, kids are not gonna become addicted. So I'm gonna take my chances, they say. And I say, okay, you know, Johnny, before you do that, um, I wanna ask you something. Would you ever drink and drive? And they say, no, of course, it's terrible, never would. And I said, that's good, I'm glad you said that. But I said, but what do you think the chances of getting into a fatal car crash are right now if you get drunk and you get into a car? What are the chances? Because you know one in six is if you try marijuana and become addicted. So given that you don't think one in six is high, what do you think it would be? And it's usually one in two, they say, one in three. The really people who think they're being really smart say like one in a hundred, one percent chance. Well, according to Mothers Against Drunk Driving, using their own statistics of people that are drunk on a daily basis get into a car and then get into a fatal car crash, that number is about one in 600, which is surprising. Now, that doesn't mean we go out and say, 599 times, you know, you're good. Of course not. We would not it's not responsible awareness for public policy. We would never do that. And I'm glad we don't do that. Similarly, I don't know why we would just brush off a number like 15%. Um, you know, we certainly wouldn't brush off a number about one in five for heroin. I mean, that doesn't mean that we think heroin is safe because thank God four kids out of the five that ever will try it once will not become addicted to it. That, 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 it does, that doesn't make sense to, to think like that. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, again, in the era of media sound bites and sort of quick narratives about things, that gets lost. Tobacco is one in four, as is cocaine for young people. Uh, heroin becomes much more addictive as you get older, which is very interesting. As you reach your late teens and early adolescence, the heroin number actually skyrockets to basically equal tobacco, and the cocaine number goes down, which is very interesting. Marijuana number also goes down, as does alcohol. That's why I was saying alcohol, if you start drinking after age 21, you have about a 10% chance of addiction. That's the same thing with marijuana. By the way, just what's interesting is a quick question. Um, how many people in here do you know someone who is addicted to drugs or alcohol who started, who never touched drugs or alcohol until about age 25? Does anybody know anybody? One. And that's usually the, the percentage I get. It's about one to two percent in every single talk that I give. That comports with national statistics. Um, so, you know, this idea that, well, we're going to, you know, people are going to start when they're later if we have like an age limit on it or something really doesn't make a lot of sense because when we're talking about those that are addicted, that are the heavy users causing the most trouble, they're starting when they're young. Legal or not, doesn't matter. They're starting when they're young. So that's why focusing on young people is, you know, in an era of sort of limited resources, is something that I think um, is worth doing. Now, a lot of parents say, why would I care about marijuana? Because, you know, I mean, so many people that I know use marijuana and they're fine, or including me, or including this person, or, you know, look at Steve Jobs, or, you know, whatever. Um, all these really smart people. I, it's funny, I did a debate the other day where the person said to me, Kevin, um, the only way marijuana is a gateway drug is that it's a gateway to the White House because the last three presidents have used marijuana. <laughs> you know, what am I going to say to that? Yes, they have. You know what? And thankfully, they, nothing happened to them. That's wonderful. But th that doesn't mean that because things, I mean, this is my example of, of things happening to individuals or stories that we know that we then sort of translate and say, see, this is an example of someone who's turned out well. We should, you know, parade and trump that. That's wonderful. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. There are plenty of people who tried heroin that are not addicted and, and actually live very normal lives right now. We wouldn't want to be saying, well, look, you know, 14 year old, you can be like this person and try heroin and get away with it. It doesn't make any sense. So a lot of the parents don't understand though that today's marijuana is not what they smoked in the dorms. 
20 or 30 years ago. Um, I mean, we're talking between three, five, ten times stronger. It, you know, take your pick on the year that you want to look at. The THC is the active ingredient in marijuana. What's really interesting is that marijuana has hundreds of ingredients in it. So when someone says marijuana, I mean, they're referring to the the, the, the part that you, you know, the, the herbal material that you smoke or vaporize or whatever. But it, it's not like saying uh, morphine or something because morphine is like one compound. Marijuana has hundreds of components. And actually, when you heat it up, it has thousands of components. And scientists only know about 10% of those components, just so you know. So I, we don't even know about everything that's in it. One thing we do know is something called THC is the ingredient that actually gets you high. That is the ingredient in marijuana, the psychoactive ingredient, we call it. We have receptors in our brain and in our body that are called cannabinoid receptors that THC binds to, meaning it, it attracts, you know, and it, that's why your memory is affected or di these different CB1 and 2 receptors in our brain and body, uh, they have different functions. Like I said, memory or whatever, a lot of other things. And THC binds to that and basically affects those things. That, that's why we have those. And um, there are many other, one of them is called, anyone's heard of CBD before? couple of people. I'm going to get into that later because it's some implications for medical marijuana, but there are not psychoactive ingredients that are barely visible in modern marijuana today. Okay. They are part of the natural cannabis plant, but if you were to buy marijuana on the street and test it as the DEA does every single day, you will find basically none of that in there. And that's because CBD actually takes the high away so if you're selling marijuana, why would you sell anything that takes the high away? And the point is to get high. Um, so, you know, their CBD has basically been bred out of modern marijuana. Now, we can talk about the reasons the THC has grown, the selective breeding, the, the, uh, the different fertilizers and actually pesticides that are used, um, you know, the, the GMO uh, issue of, um, you know, not, talk about non-organic material um, in terms of the way it's changed. Is, is pretty dramatic. But I think that's something that a lot of people, a lot of parents don't understand is that today's pot is just not the pot of even the 80s or 90s, let alone the 70s or 60s. And, you know, there are, uh, of course, new ways. Uh, this is just the average of four, about 13%. There are new ways to ingest marijuana. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of dabbing before or waxing. This is like 80 to 90% THC in a wax that's sometimes used at the end of a needle, combusted with butane oil, and uh, basically ingested, a, you know, sort of one big puff, basically, in your face. And, I mean, that's like 80 to 90% THC. And the most experienced marijuana users whose brains, I mean, 14% is like water to them. They would, they would not react to that anymore because their brains are so addicted to THC. They're so used to it that... But they are now going on to this 80 to 90 percent because it's actually giving them a new high that they never had before. Um, by the way, it's also sending thousands of people to the emergency room, but you know, we don't hear about that a lot. Um, and as, speaking of the emergency room, we know what's so interesting is that, you know, if we were to look 20 years ago at the number of marijuana users versus now, it's about the same. I mean, the numbers have gone up and down, they're a little different, but maybe for statistical purposes, they're about the same. What's shocking is that there are 20 times more people going to the emergency room for marijuana-related admissions than they were before, even though it's the same number of people using. And a lot of scientists think it's because of the THC. I mean, the fact that now it's a lot stronger, um, you know, th this idea of going to the ER for an acute panic attack 30 years ago was extremely rare. I mean, that was not something we saw in hospital. Now, I mean, not just with marijuana, but we're seeing it just in, in just hundreds of thousands every year for acute panic attacks, psychotic episodes. And we know that about 400,000 plus of those relate to marijuana. Um, and it's usually, like I said, like an acute kind of attack, uh, like a panic attack type of thing. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details about where it affects the brain, et cetera, because we have a lot to cover. But essentially, it does affect the brain. It does affect mental illness. We can talk about that in the questions if we want to. But there is incontrovertible evidence about the connection between early cannabis use. Now, if you have a predisposed, uh, you know, genetic disposition, even more so, but even without that, the connection to schizophrenia, psychosis, to a lesser extent, depression, anxiety is very strong. I don't, I think it goes without saying that it hurt, it's an irritant to the lungs. We don't have the evidence on lung cancer right now. Okay, we have to, again, be honest about what we have and what we don't. The lung cancer evidence is mixed. But by the way, you know what's so interesting about lung cancer is, um, you know, how many people think that uh, uh, lung cancer link with smoking 
was found in 1964 when the Surgeon General <laughs> released it. No. How about, raise your hand if you think it was found in the 50s, 10 years before, 40s? So you all know what I'm getting. 30s, 20s, yeah, this is a smart group. Early 1900s, 1909. We had very strong evidence about, but it was suppressed for 50 years by an industry that I'll get into later, made money off of addiction. I mean, let's be very clear. Addictive industries, you're gonna hear me over and over, they only make money off of those that are addicted. So if you enjoyed a glass of wine with your dinner last night, I have some news to break to you. You are very unimportant people when it comes to the eyes of the alcohol industry. Very unimportant because you're not the person who has 10 glasses of wine every night on top of hard liquor and is spending a lot of your family's money on alcohol. If you're that person, they love you. Um, it's the same reason why if you go to Las Vegas or wherever you can go for to gamble, uh, that you, who gets the Trump Tower suite? The person who plays $100 blackjack once a year for his birthday? Or the guy who bets his life savings on the craps table? I mean, so it, it, there's a reason for that. It's not because they just like think that that guy is more cool than the other guy. It's because these are industries that they only profit off of the heaviest users of whatever industry you're talking about. And I think that has huge implications for marijuana. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But I couldn't help dig on the tobacco industry a little bit just because of that, that issue with cancer. Um, if I were to choose one study that I think has the most implications for this country as we're entering a, com well, we're in a global competitive workforce, it is the issue of IQ. We now have evidence from a very large, what you would call a population longitudinal study. What does that mean? It means that researchers followed the same thousand people for 40 years and asked them any question and every question under the sun to learn about the human condition, essentially. And what they basically found out was if you were a heavy user of marijuana in your teenage years, even when, if you stopped as an adult, you had an average of six to eight point reduction in IQ. Significant, uh, significant chance that you would have a six to eight point reduction in IQ, controlling for, na you name it, your school attainment, other drugs, whatever. That has huge implications for our workforce and our economy, because what is eight point IQ, what does that mean? Well, obviously if you're a genius at 150, um, like probably everyone in here is, we, you know, if you go down to 142, not, we're not going to notice. So, you know, you're still going to be a genius. But, you know, I, I, and I always, parents have a hard time understanding that not every child can be a genius. That's why we have what's called an average. <laughs> so the average <laughs> is about 100 is the average, right? The average of a kid today is 100. It's, you know, um, you go eight points below that to 92. From, that is a significant difference. I mean, that is the difference between finishing up your degree or not. That is the difference between the job promotion or not. Um, and so when I think about where we are as a country and where we're trying to go in this economy right now, and I am looking at India, and I am looking at China, I am looking at the, Korea, and I'm looking at the education level there versus the, let's just say, distractions that they don't have that we do. Um, from an economic point of view, that is actually a scary thought. I mean, I, you know, I, we want to think about this is a health issue, but just to put on the economics hat for a minute, it's just, it's something that I don't think anybody in Colorado or Washington, when they were voting for this, could have ever thought of, you know, when that was, because that was not part of the debate at all. Um, and a lot of things are missing from this t discussion. Dropping out of school, that, I'm going to, the workplace issue was huge. I mean, I, you know, if you're a small business owner, owner, the issue of absences, tardiness, accidents, etc. Let's go to the second myth because we have seven here, but that was by far the longest, so I'm going to move even, even faster. Um, this issue about marijuana is medicine. You know, when somebody asks me in an elevator, they say, what do you do? Or what are you here for? Why are you in this strange hotel in this town? Usually I'm here to talk about marijuana. Oh, and the first question they say is, is marijuana medicine? What do you think about medical marijuana? I mean, that's like the number one thing because it's been sort of the discussion for 20 years. And my answer is essentially, yeah, marijuana has medicinal properties. However, we don't need to smoke or eat it to get those properties. Why? Well, we don't smoke opium to get the effect of morphine. Okay, Opium, it's a, poppy is a natural plant. You know, last night the debater said, marijuana is natural and it's from God and it's just the great, you know, and I was like, well, you know, hemlock and uranium is, are also natural, but that, that's okay, we can, that, that's fine. But the point is, 
we have a lot of things that are, I mean, willow bark is natural, and but we wouldn't tell you if you had a headache now. Thankfully, we've moved on. We wouldn't say, you know, go chew some willow bark um, because I think that tree's a good one and, you know, there isn't any nasty stuff on it, so you should be okay. We would say, go have an aspirin. And I'm not in favor of a super pharmaceutical country that prescribes pills and think for every little thing, but, but I do see the benefit in being able to say, Go have an aspirin. You're from New York, but the aspirin in Florida is the same aspirin you'd get in New York, and you know the dosage. I think that makes a little more sense than go rip off the willow bark, and I hope it works out for you because I don't know if that was exposed to rain or not, whatever. I, I think that the aspirin thing does make sense. Well, I think it's the same thing with marijuana. We should standardize medicines derived from marijuana, period. It's actually not very difficult, but because this issue is so emotional, we never have a chance to talk about any rational uh, uh, sort of endpoints because people are too busy with an emotional story. So we need to make a distinction. Remember I said marijuana has hundreds of components? We need to make a distinction between those components and the raw herbal material. Now that doesn't mean that you can't even have a medicine based on the herbal material that you know is standardized. but. The idea of just saying, well, we can, why would I want to get it from a pharmacy because I can grow it in my backyard, really is something that we would have said in the 1600s. I mean, it's, it's something before modern medicine. And the idea that we want to go back to that, I, I, don't, I really don't get it. Um, so the answer is complicated. Is marijuana medicine? No. Smoke marijuana is not. Yes, there are marijuana-based pills available and other medications that I'm going to talk about coming soon. And probably most interesting, maybe. Research is ongoing, right? There is research going on now um, that, that are, you know, scientifically developed. I agree the process needs to be improved. I'm not going to go into details about that. Um, we have a drug coming up through the FDA right now. If you suffer from cancer or multiple sclerosis, you can enroll in a clinical trial that's in phase three. In fact, they're having a bit of a hard time enrolling patients, which is ironic given the appetite for medical marijuana everywhere. That's the interesting thing. Um, I guess people just want the real thing. They don't want a medication that's standardized. Um, but there's a mouth spray. It doesn't get you high. It has THC. It also has CBD, one-to-one -one ratio. It is a whole plant extract, so you can't, you can't say, well, I really want the whole plant because of synergistic effects between you know, the, the terpenes and the flavonoids. That's actually there because it is the whole plant extracted into a liquid with the THC and CBD in a very difficult process bred so that they're equal, which is not, remember, modern marijuana has no CBD in it, so this is very different than that, equal, and you don't smoke it. You put it on the, on the tongue or in the mouth. And it's approved in 24 countries, by the way. There's not one death. There's no drug, drug, drug driving as a result. Um, frankly, I wish it would be approved here faster. It's taken a while. Um, but unfortunately, in the absence of that, we've had to say, well, we need medical marijuana, right? A state needs medical marijuana. Well, the question is, we've had medical marijuana in states for 20 years. What's been the experience, I think, is something that Florida should first ask itself. Because you're not going to be the first state to do this. You're going to be the 23rd if you do it. Well. We know that this is the way that it's sold. It's sold for the sick and dying grandmother dying of cancer. Um, unfortunately, the average patient looks a lot more like that. 32-year-old white male, history of drug abuse, no history of chronic illness. Um, you know, when I saw that the numbers in California went from like 500 cards to over 200,000, I, I said, wow, th there was a epidemic of, you know, end-stage breast cancer among 31-year-old white males that we never heard about. Um, because, you know, those are the people that were supposed to be benefiting from this. Well, in reality, the way that the, the, the initiative was written, it says every single horrible illness known to man in the first paragraph, and then in tiny print at the end, in the California initiative, it says, or pain, or any other illness for which you think it provides relief. I mean, these things are written on purpose like that. Who reads, who has read an entire ballot initiative? Okay, we're, don't be embarrassed. I don't, one. Okay, yes, exactly. So, so who would ever want anyone to suffer? I mean, that's the other thing. It's like if somebody was dying of, you know, and, and had six months to live, you know what, I don't care if they want, I don't care what they want. I would love for them to have whatever makes them, comforts them at the end of life. That is not what these medical marijuana initiatives are about at all. In Colorado, in all the states actually, less than 2% of people have cancer. 
Less than 1% have HIV. And by the way, on the HIV thing, you know, I want to just say this for a second. You know, the AIDS movement was uh, very much into medical marijuana in the 80s because, well, it's not a surprise, marijuana increases your appetite, right? You get the munchies. That's, that's one of the things that THC does. And if you're dying of end-stage AIDS in 1986, which is a death sentence, you are usually wasting away. And that's one of the things is you can't hold down food and you're scared. Okay, so yes, medical marijuana at that point, marijuana would have been good for that community. You know what's so interesting now is the AIDS movement is not really the ones at all carrying the banner for medical marijuana anymore. Why? Because the antiretroviral drugs that we're so thankful to have that now make sure that AIDS is not a death sentence, if properly taken, there is no wasting syndrome. There is no what we would call Carposi's sarcoma, another horrible condition related to end-stage AIDS. So actually, those have been almost eliminated from our country. I and mean, that's a public health victory that no one ever talks about. Yet, when we see these initiatives, we still see that HIV AIDS, because it pulls at the heartstrings, is the second, uh, usually the second condition listed after cancer. Well, what's not said is nobody's using it for HIV AIDS. I mean, they might have AIDS and they're, they're using marijuana, but the connection between their condition and the need for marijuana is not there anymore. Because if you're on the antiretrovirals, which 99% of people in this country have AIDS are on, you are not wasting away anymore, thankfully. But anyhow, um, glaucoma, the American Glaucoma Association basically says, please stay away from this stuff. It is not good for your intraocular pressure of your eye. On and on, the idea of smoking marijuana is just not approved by any medical uh, association or group. And then when we look behind, well, if it's not approved by a medical association, who wants it? Well, it's, it is the legalization movement. 40 years ago, the guy, in fact, I, his successors who I debated last night said, we will use medical marijuana as a red herring to give marijuana a good name. And I have to tell you, it's a, you know, as, as much scorn that I have internally for sort of lying to the American people for 50 years about your intentions, it's a brilliant PR move. I mean, it actually worked out very well for them. They did it very, very successfully because it started down the path in this country to the discussion we're at today, which is really on legalization. It's, it's we've moved beyond medical. Um, although in the state it's medical. Um, we do know that residents of states with medical marijuana have higher rates of abuse among kids. And I've had people say, well, of course they have higher rates of abuse. You're legalizing medical marijuana. Well, it's not just the people using it for so-called medical purposes. It's kids and other indicators show higher levels of use. Um, now let's talk about CBD. This is an issue in, in, in Florida that I know has been discussed. There is a component in marijuana called CBD, as I said, that it does not get you high. Okay, I already talked about that. There is not uh, uh, double blind placebo studies, but there are preclinical and also some anecdotes that CBD could help children with uncontrollable epilepsy. Did anybody see the CNN special? Or is everybody familiar with this issue? Sort of? Okay. Um, and there was a CNN special that essentially said, you know, this is, this is wonderful. There is this, the what CNN based their special on what everyone's talking about is something called Charlotte's Web. Anyone ever heard of that? It's named after a little girl who has 300 seizures a day. And frankly, I mean, I can't imagine any, but anything worse for a parent. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, but it's an oil derived from the marijuana plant that uh, has been created by a group of people who started in Colorado selling medical marijuana. And in fact, 99% of their business is selling marijuana cigarettes for any, any reason for, to anybody. But as a side thing, and really what's getting a lot of the press, is the CBD oil called Charlotte's Web, because it's, it's just got national press. Now, a lot of people have said, we need medical marijuana for these kids. This is what would, we would legalize it for them. It's wonderful. Um, this is the way we need to do it. We need this oil today, right now. I think the question is, we want children, obviously, to get medicines that help them. I think, I don't know anybody who would disagree with that, okay? Even if it's an experimental medicine. I mean, if you're desperate, you're desperate. I get it. The question isn't if or should they. In my mind, the question is how. What's the mechanism? That's the policy question, right? You want something to get done, you already decided it should get done? Okay, that's not, you're not done yet. You gotta talk about how it happens. So right now we're presented with basically two choices. There's really two. The, the, uh, actually, I'll start with the second choice first, is the status quo. Go to Colorado, sign up for Charlotte's Web, 
be number 127 on the wait list. Hope that your state legalizes it in the meantime so that if you bring it over to Florida or wherever, you're not committing a federal felony, because it would be. It's CBD's an illegal drug. It's part of marijuana, Schedule 1. Oh, and hope that what you get is exactly what's advertised, because there's absolutely zero assurances. This is quasi-illegal. It's only legal on the state level. So you're on a wait list. There's no assurances, with the exception of the lab technicians hired by the company who claim that this is a, and they, they could be right. I mean, parents are using this. I'm not doubting that it's, it works, actually. You know, but the point is, you don't have any assurances. Um, you could do that, or there are other products by other companies that say, high CBD, it's like a high CBD soda, or something perfect for your daughter or son. Well, what those non, not the Charlotte's Web, but the other ones that say they're high CBD, because that's the buzzword now, CBD, um, when those are tested, they have very high amounts of THC in them. The last thing that you would want somebody with seizures, let alone a child brain that's three years old to be exposed to. I mean, THC poison for a three-year-old with seizures. Not, you do not want above trace levels of THC for those children. So you basically have those choices, or you can go on the internet and order something. Um, and so I don't blame, or I really, really don't blame parents for going to any lengths to get those things that, that help them and they think they're gonna help them. I, I'm not. The question for me though is, how do, we, how do we bring this to scale and make it a policy? What makes sense? That route that I just described, or something that actually we've been, I've been pushing very hard for with my organization's Smart Approaches to Marijuana, which I'll talk about at the end, through something called an expanded IND research program. IND stands for Investigational New Drug. What does it mean? It means that if I find that a, there's a drug in Armenia that helps me, and I'm in the US and no one's ever heard of it, I ask my doctor, I really want this drug that I found in Armenia, because it just really helps me, but it, it's like non-existent here. What do I do? The doctor applies to the FDA, for an application for an investigational new drug. Now, normally, because of those are unknown drugs, you don't have to go through the DEA at all because it's not a scheduled drug. If I had a drug no one's heard of from Armenia, the DEA has nothing to do with it. It's not scheduled, it's no schedule. But the FDA has to say, yes, you know, we'll, we'll let a doctor over, you know, give it to you, oversight, you can import it from another country legally, no problem. So that is kind of the way that we're now going with CBD. Basically, there is a purified CBD product from the UK. It's um, not surprisingly produced by the same very small research company that also produced the Sativex mouth spray. And it's called Epidiolex. Epidiolex is a, basically a whole plant extract. So a lot of parents think that they need everything in the plant. This is everything in the plant. but it's trace THC, it's just what would you, it's literally like the lowest level you can scientifically get out of it. I mean, it's a, brother, this is a very expensive, difficult extraction process to be able to get CBD like that is, it's just, I'm not gonna go through the science, science on it. it's very difficult. Anyway, there are batches from the UK where basically they have high CBD and more or less nothing else but trace amounts of everything else. The FDA has, set, has looked at that and they have approved that conditionally for INDs. Now they haven't approved it to go to a pharmacy, but because that's a later process, that's after clinical trials. But preclinical trials, it's IND. So these doctors, I believe there's someone in Miami, is the latest that I've heard, I don't know if you all know this, I believe there's a doctor in Miami um, who has applied successfully for an IND. That means that doctor can look after 25 children, 25 per application, um, and over, oversee that Epidiolex. And by the way, that Epidiolex is free right now. The, the, the company in the UK is giving it for free to everybody. Um, so, because they also want to collect data. I mean, this is obviously very good for them. This is preclinical studies. Then they go into clinical trials. That's how it works. And to me, that sounds a lot more sensible than to tell someone, you know what, you need to move to Colorado and get on a waiting list for something that the FDA has never looked at. Now, I get that some people, for whatever reason, that's still gonna be an option for them, and I don't 
blame them. And I don't think they should go to jail. And I don't think they should be chided by it. But as we're creating policy, the other thing is a lot of people say, well, that's a, that takes a long time and whatever. We should grow it in Florida and do it ourselves. Well, it, first of all, it's a super expensive process. And secondly, you can't just grow it. I mean, it takes, it's going to take at least 10 months from today. If you were to start today and say that you had government approval to grow marijuana, which is illegal, but to grow it for the purpose of CBD it would probably take eight to 10 months to get any product. And it would be very limited quantity. The purpose is we need to bring this to scale for people who need it. So what we're trying to do is build off of those expanded research programs and expand them even more. Because I think 25 is probably too few kids. We should have more doctors involved. Basically blow up the program a little bit so that every child who needs to be served can be served. So that parents don't have to be in a desperate situation. Um, but you know, it's very hard to have that rational conversation and discussion when we're just only looking at pictures of four-year-olds having uncontrollable seizures. I mean, that's a very difficult thing that would that hurts us all. Um, we need to do it the right way, though. And I think the compassionate way is to say, we get that it's not FDA approved. We're not going to wait for approval. That'll take a decade. So before that, let's have them enroll in special programs to get them a product that we actually know what's in it. Because right now, you know, whether it's CBD or other drugs related to medical marijuana in these dispensaries, at the end of the day, you have no idea what's in it. You want a dosage? You can't get a dosage. You want to know how it interacts with other drugs? Good luck with that, because it's not a doctor who's doing it, uh, who's selling it to you. You want to know what's the exact characterization of the marijuana strain you're smoking? You've got to take their word for it. And you're usually buying something called, you know, super silver haze, and that's supposed to be medicine. So rather than kind of have that what's turned into a joke, let's make it medical and make it so you can get it from a pharmacy. I think that makes a lot more sense. Um, myth three, very, very short. The bottom line is people think there are countless people behind bars for only smoking marijuana. We looked at the data in the Obama administration. It is almost impossible to find people in state prison whose only crime is smoking marijuana. That is a huge huge myth. One of the biggest myths that I encounter is people think that if you have a joint, you're automatically behind bars. Now, jail and arrest record is a different story. And so, you know, I'm going to go into, I don't think that people should be jailed for even 24 hours or given an arrest record for a very small amount of marijuana because especially a first time, especially a youth, I think there are other things, diversion programs, drug courts, the, the judge just left, but she has a misdemeanor drug court that basically only handles marijuana cases, assessments, education, those things are, are what's needed. But there is something to say to keep it illegal. You need to have some sanction. So whether it's a fine or whatever it is, I think would be good. We don't want to throw people in prison, but we also don't want to say, well, because we don't want to throw people in prison, we're going to have to legalize. I think that's a bridge too far. Um, and I want to get into those reasons why very soon. So I'm going to skip. Okay, this is the big one, which is the legality of alcohol and tobacco strengthen the case, people say, for marijuana legalization, right? You've all heard that. Alcohol is legal and it's very harmful. Does anybody in here not know a family member or friend who's been acutely affected by alcoholism? Okay, nobody. So it's a huge issue. So people say, well, that's horrible. Why is that legal? And marijuana is not. Um, what I say back is alcohol and tobacco are the last models we would ever use for public health. Um, first of all, the use levels are much higher. We already talked about that. Secondly, as I said earlier, these industries promote addiction. And when you promote addiction, where do you start? Kids. You have to because, as we saw here, only one person and only 1% of people who are having a problem with drugs and alcohol start after 21. So if you're a company that's in the business of cooking people, you better get them young. Otherwise, you're too late. You're going to get 1%. Um, that's, folks, what this really comes down to for me. I am not against legalization because I don't think that a 50-year-old guy or gal who wants to smoke a joint in the privacy of their own home after a hard week of work should be treated like a criminal. That's not why I think it's a... I don't really care about that situation, actually. I really don't. The reason I care about like, being against legalization is because it's going to start a new industry that's going to target kids. That's the only business model that's ever worked. And... When I see commercials that say enjoy responsibly, you know, on the bottom in like the times two fonts that you can, you have to like, you can't really even read. And when I see the commercial, what are the best commercials at the Super Bowl, guys? The beer commercials. I mean, they have the most to lose. I mean, it's, of course it's the best commercial. It's the funniest ones. And they're all targeting kids. I mean, you look at the symbols that they use. 
When I see enjoy responsibly, I do laugh because if everybody enjoyed responsibly, we would have no industry. <laughs> there would be no such thing as a beer commercial. Like they couldn't afford it. <laughs> so it's, it's a true irony. And when I look at people say, well, we can tax it and we're not gonna. When I look at the taxes for alcohol today and I see that they are a fifth of what they were than during the Korean War, not Gulf War, not weren't Korean War. When I say that in front of high school kids, nobody knows when the Korean War was. was that they're all Wikipediaing it. Literally, I, they're all down on their smartphones figuring. I mean, so it's that long ago that we've even raised taxes on alcohol. And um, this is what I'm actually afraid of here. The marbleization of marijuana. This is the symbol I'm afraid of. Am I afraid of the, like, you know, ex-hippie who wants to smoke a joint and sing Kumbaya in his basement? I, no. Have a blast. I don't care. I, I care about this. <laughs> and we are so naive if we think that we can be neutral on an issue that we happen to be alive right now when we're going through the most important debate in public health that we've had in this country in the last 150 years. I just have to break it to you. We're alive during that time. That's right now. Why? We're about to legalize permanently a third addictive drug. Now, for all of the things about alcohol and tobacco, could anybody truthfully say that there's a chance in hell we'd go back to prohibition in our lifetime of alcohol or tobacco? No. And I'm not arguing for that. I, you know, people say, well, Kevin, you hate alcohol. Do you want prohibition? No, we're stuck with it. We're stuck with it. Better or worse, we've made the, the, the decision. We'd rather have the civil liberty and live with the billions of social costs and lives damaged. Fine. We've lived with that. I'm not going to fight against that. Now, I'm going to work against underage drinking and that kind of thing. But, you know, good luck working in underage anything when the environment is going to be so conducive to normalization. And a lot of people say to me, Kevin, tobacco has gone down way down among kids. And we haven't arrested a soul, and it's legal. Why can't we do that for marijuana? Well, the social environment for tobacco, in terms of the attitudes, are so at the opposite spectrum for marijuana right now. It, it's a joke to think that right now, if give, you know, it would be legal, and we could go to that social stigmatization, right? Um, Tobacco has been legal for 150 years. Only recently has it's, have it's gone, it's gone down, right? It's not because it's legal that it's going down. It's because there's social stigma. That's why tobacco is going down. Not because it's legal. It's been legal. It was never going down. And now we're entering where we're going to say, well, let's treat marijuana the same way. But now our social environment is, I mean, does anyone think that we're not in a permissive environment right now for marijuana? I mean, I talk to kids and they say, Kevin, I would rather drive, I'm going to drive stoned. It's better than driving high. And I say, really? Well, why do you, why do you think that? And they say, well, because when I drive, uh, sorry, when I drive drunk, I mean, when I drive drunk, you know, I'm going like 80 in a 60. And that's just horrible and I'm driving recklessly. Okay, I say, good, don't drive drunk. That's good. Well, what happens when you drive high that you think it's okay? Well, I'm going 30 in a 60. <laughs> You know, and, and they're not realizing that going 30 in a 60 is about as dangerous as going 80 in a 60 for different reasons. Again, it's like, you know, is your leg broken or your arm broken? I don't want any of them broken. Why, why is that? The, it's not like I, one is better than the other. Marijuana tr doubles to triples your risk of a car crash and alcohol quadruples to quintuples your risk of a car crash. That doesn't mean that alcohol, the marijuana, then you should choose that over alcohol. It means that both are really dangerous. The, the chances of a car crash are elevated dramatically with either. Um, but again, we have lived in this, there's this recent environment, I think it started with medicine, really, medical, that kids just think if it's medicine, it must be good for you. Um, and now, you know, they're going on the internet. Last night, um, the, one of my debating opponents says, it's so wonderful, when I was debating this issue in the 90s, there was no internet. And so, but now kids can learn for themselves, if they just Google marijuana, they can find out the truth. And, and I said, y do you really believe everything you read on the internet? I mean. You know, is that really where we're going? And by the way, you should Google marijuana and see how long it would take you to find a website with scientific information that's been peer reviewed. Just good luck with that. And that's what our teens are being exposed to right now on their smartphones when they think about is marijuana addictive and they write that in Google. Just see what comes up. You'll be shocked. Um, so this is what I'm concerned about is this industry that's going to mimic the playbook of big tobacco. The Wall Street Journal had a thing that the Yale MBAs are here. And that is really what we're talking about, folks. You know, your old friend with the long hair and the, who was part of the peace movement in, in college and smoke bot, that's not who's going to be leading this effort. 
You know, they don't look like that. They don't have their hemp t-shirts on and their ponytails. They, they, have, they look like this guy. And in fact, some people think this guy looks like me and I'm thoroughly offended. But anyway, the point is, they look like me, <laughs> right? They, and they, they do have their Ivy League MBAs. This is about making money. This is about being the green rush. Read, read what, what's being said. The pioneers of a new business. They see this as a massive business opportunity. And anytime anybody, whether it's a government, I don't care if it's a government that wants tax revenue or it's a business, when you're whole incentive is to make money, that means you have to increase addiction. Because there's no way, like I, like I said earlier, there's no way to make money unless you do that. And I don't care if you're a government or you're a corporation. Marijuana Inc. I mean, it's just on and on and on. I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know, by the way, the tobacco industry, I'm not going to read this now, is also expressing interest. 30 years ago in the 70s, I mean, are we surprised? Um, they said, we have the land to grow it, the machines to roll it and package it, and the distribution to market it. They do. They're right. It'd be very easy for them. Um, you know, my next book right now is looking at the tobacco industry and the marijuana industry and looking at the, the eerie parallels, you know, the distortion of science, the funding of your own science, <laughs> the questioning of any credible science. You know, you can't get by one news day now of a news story on marijuana that actually, because you know, when the scientists talk about marijuana, they're very clear about it, about the damage it does. Most of the studies show the damage. Every time there's a study now showing the damage, hours later, there are massive press releases with all of the reasons why the study should be questioned. That is exactly what the tobacco industry did when the scientific community in 1920 was saying that there's a connection to cancer. And we're just, this is just history repeating itself. And when I go and look at the tobacco documents, which, I've, which we can all get a hold of and I, I'm reading now, and I read their internal memoranda, it makes you want to vomit. And it makes you want to cry, actually, because you see that these are companies that have t wanting to, they feel unfairly targeted that they can't tar uh, market to smokers under age 18 because only less than a third of them start after age 18. So they need to get to the kids because that's the only way they feel very, un you know, they're very discriminated against, they feel. Um, when I read the Project Youth Cigarette from what's now R.J. Reynolds, marketing innovation suggestions and I see apple flavor and sweet flavor and how it appeals to youth and how freshness is what youth want. That to me is very scary and that to me is what exactly we are going to be going through over and again with marijuana. When I read that the former Winston man, the model for cigarettes in the 1970s who ends up you know by the age of 37 having COPD, emphysema, seizure. I mean, he had everything you could imagine related to cigarettes, illnesses, because he was a chain smoker. And he talks about, he was at a um, modeling shoot, photo shoot for Winston. And there were a lot of cigarettes as part of the props. And the executives were all sitting, it was their big national campaign of like 1978 or something. And after the photo shoot was over, he said, it was like 25, he said, uh, hey guys, I know you're probably going to take the cigarettes back for yourself because these were full of cigarette cartons. And uh, they, but do you mind if I take one or something? Because there were like 10. And they said, no, you can take them all. And he said, really? Like, you, why don't you want them? You mean you don't smoke? These are the executives of the, the Winston, the tobacco company. They said, well, um, no, we don't smoke the expletive. We just sell it. We reserve that right for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. So again, who do these industries target? Let's just remind ourselves. <laughs> Where are the liquor stores centered in this country? Are there more in Beverly Hills or Compton? I mean, I have a California thing, so we'll talk about, I don't know, I can't do the comparison for Florida, but where are they centered in? Of course, they're centered in Compton. There are eight times as many liquor stores and advertising in poor black and Hispanic communities in this country than in upper class white communities. So, you know, the, if we think that this isn't going to happen again, well, and by the way, why is that? Well, because when you're in the upper class white community, you know, it's a lot easier to write the $50,000 check to Betty Ford Treatment Center. You have those resources. You're more likely to have an education and access to health care and housing and things that, are sta that would stabilize you and make you less likely 
to suffer the negative effects of addiction versus if you live in a community that doesn't have those things, those protective factors, right? And these companies know it. And by the way, don't get me started on the lottery and where those are centered. By the way, I thought the lottery was supposed to be the savior for public education with the tax revenue. How's that working out for you here? Yeah. Now we're being offered marijuana as the savior. Um, you know, these are things that people just don't hear because all they hear about is war on drugs has failed and marijuana is medicine and we can make a lot of money off this. Let's do it. These other things are not considered at all. Um, so my question is, will marijuana become the new big tobacco? That is the question I ask. And I look at vending machines now and billboards. Remember the tobacco vending machines that groups like this spent 30 years to get rid of? A billion dollar industry is a victory. Well, good luck. Now we have the new version of it. It's called marijuana vending machines. And it's not a joke. Look it up. Medbox Inc. Please look it up. They made $5 million in revenue last year under a non-legal regime. We didn't have legal sales even legal. How did they make $5 million under the medicine? These are because, you know, every dying, sick, and cancer patient really wants THC popcorn bought from a vending machine. That's really what they're going to be wanting. Well, <laughs> um, the, the billboards... Um, this is, I think, one of the worst, I mean, the edibles, I mean, if this isn't aimed at children, please tell me what is. When I see ring pots and sodas and pot tarts, um, kids are going to the ER every day, guys, right now, because they're ingesting, I mean, would you know what a marijuana gumdrop is versus a regular gumdrop? Would you, by looking at it? Of course not. By smelling it? Definitely not. Well, a two-year-old kid doesn't know the difference either. Um, and they are getting in the hands of them. So I think there's no money in this for anyone other than big marijuana, what I call big marijuana. And actually, let's go to this for a minute. Our alcohol and tobacco talk, uh, costs are 10 times the revenue we get. So we're hearing like, Colorado, it's wonderful. They're going to make $100 million this year. Well, what was the cost of that? <laughs> it's not free. <laughs> it's not just you, you, you can legalize marijuana and there's no negative effects. And now you just you see yourself with 100 million more. And by the way, the joke of that is the 100 million, is not, it's not like it's going to new things like schools and all that even. 98% of it is going to mitigate the effects of that policy. So it's like, we're going to do something horrible. And then the money we make from that horrible thing, we're going to spend, it's like, we're going to spend, like, I'm going to go in front of a car so I can get run over. Then I'm going to have massive head trauma. But the money that I make from that settlement is all of it's going to go to my hospital bills. Isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, it's just, what world are we living in sometimes? I think to myself. Um, I'm not going to go into these details about Europe, but if you have questions, basically, we are going way beyond Europe right now. Just so if you think like Holland is like on the cutting edge, no, no, no. Colorado and Washington, their laws now are way beyond what Portugal, Holland, Spain, anybody ever did. And I can go into those details after if you'd like. We just don't, I, I want to move forward. I'm not going to focus on this. As the final myth of my book is prevention and treatment are doomed to fail. Why try? We don't need to talk to you about why they're not doomed to fail. What are the policy implications? Well, so the question is, why is this our field's chief policy issue? Why can you not afford to be neutral, basically, on this is, is the question. And the answer is, first of all, it's a discussion that completely changes our work environment. I mean, you're in prevention and treatment, and now you have an environment of legalized marijuana? Good luck. Ten minutes. Um, so, and so i got to move fast. It has the potential to overpower our most perfectly executed programs. It has very little opposition right now. And after 50 years of trying, two states have now legalized. Um, and I'm going to just go forward. Basically, Colorado has had a de facto legalization for the last ten, uh, seven years, guys. This isn't new in Colorado. Why? They've had the most lax medical marijuana. So if you have a pulse, you get a card. I mean, that's basically what it is. You don't need cancer. And they've already seen negative effects. Uh, you can go to our website, learnaboutsam.org. All of this information is on there because um, we have to wrap up. But essentially, it, it's not pretty in Colorado. They've had drug-related referrals uh, have increased for those testing positive. Uh, they've had people, kids in treatment. Three quarters of the teens in treatment in Denver got their marijuana from a medical dispensary. Wow. And they're not teens with end-stage cancer. Um, if Denver was an American state, it would have the highest public high school rate of marijuana in the country, Denver. 
uh, the car crashes, all car crashes went down except for marijuana. That was the only thing that went up at the time. I'm going to go forward. Um, so here we are in 2014. Colorado's now allowed retail sales. We saw the picture. You know, this was the picture on the front of every newspaper on January 1st. And the headline was, you know, legalization going smoothly. No one has been killed in line. It's like, okay, that's the standard, I guess. No one's head's gotten blown off while they're waiting for pot, so it must be a success. Um, but it wasn't a success. We've had multiple kids now be, or have been gone to the ER for pot cookie ingestion and other things. We have stores declaring that the high school senior is his ideal target customer. Remember, 21 and over. Any of you know any high school seniors that are 21? I guess if you fail five years, but that's another story. Um, the state of Colorado thought that they could tag the marijuana plants so they could track them. That, that never happened. What a surprise. Yeah. And websites are now telling people how to move Colorado marijuana to surrounding states. So that was supposed to be something that they weren't going to allow to do. Well, it's happening now. Open any. This took me five minutes. The coupons. And if you look at the, if any of you are familiar with the price of marijuana and you look at how low these prices are, 118 for an ounce. There was something the other day, $99 an ounce, $50 an ounce uh, we saw. I mean, the price has collapsed. And we know, why do the tobacco and alcohol companies hate taxes? Because when you, rate, when you make their product more expensive, less people use them. That's true. So now we're doing the opposite with marijuana. We're collapsing the price. Do we not think that pe more people are going to use? Uh, Washington's going to be happening soon, and these are the states that are now targeted in the next few years. Florida is targeted for medical, not for recreational quite yet. Um, so just kind of to end, what are our choices for policy? People think that we either have to lock people up or we have to legalize, and I reject either of those choices. We don't want to increase incarceration. We have seen the devastating effects of mass incarceration on communities. On the other hand, why does that mean that therefore we should legalize? Um, and that's unfortunately how the discussion's been set up in this country. So it's, for me, it's not about legalization or incarceration. I think we can be against legalization, but also in favor of health, in favor of education. So that's why we started this group called SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Former Congressman Patrick Kennedy left Congress and basically saw what was going on with the marijuana issue in this country and wanted to do something about it. So we co-founded this group. We have four objectives. We want to inform public policy with the science of today's marijuana. The gap between what scientists know and what the public misunderstands is just enormous, is unbelievable. We want to bridge that gap. We do want to have an honest conversation about reducing current policies, unintended consequences. We don't want to see people with an arrest record that are going to destroy their lives for smoking pot. We don't want to see people thrown in jail in certain local jurisdictions. So we want to figure out alternatives to those things. But we really want to prevent the establishment of what we're calling big marijuana. And by the way, we did not come up with the term big marijuana. The industry themselves did. They're proud of it. You know, a former Number three at Microsoft, if you haven't heard, joined with the ex-president of Mexico, Vincente Fox. And they basically said, we are big marijuana. They are starting what they're calling the Starbucks of marijuana. Um, so this is about billions. And by the way, we want to promote research into marijuana's medical properties. It can be helpful for people. We need to get kids what they need. We need to get adults what they need. But we need to do it the right way, not by selling, you know, a strain called green crack by a 22-year-old kid with no medical experience. Not, it's not the right way to do it. You know, and tell me in what book is that more compassionate than saying go to your doctor and get something that you actually know what's in it. So we want to promote that. So we're a national group with state and local partners. Uh, these are just, you know, some of, we, are, we have a public health board of directors including like tobacco researchers and others. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to read the quote. Let's not be naive to think that this movement stops at marijuana, okay? If you think that the money behind marijuana legalization is actually about marijuana and not about cocaine, heroin, and other drugs, you've got to research what's going on. These groups have other end games. Remember, medical was the start. Their end wasn't medical. They moved to legal. Marijuana. Now, their aim, game is not legal marijuana. It's so in 30 years, we could have, be having this discussion again, except... We're not talking about legalizing marijuana. That'd be done. We're now talking about legalizing a fourth and a fifth or a sixth drug. 
let's think about where we're going. Um, and finally, some things we're testing out PSA-wise. These are not ready for prime time, but essentially, can you tell the difference between the real thing and the marijuana candy? No, neither can your kids. Um, let's have a history lesson. 1964, more doc uh, advertisement, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Talked about how healthy it was, despite the AMA saying it's a health hazard. Now, marijuana is safe. It's medicine. It's a candy bar. Despite the AMA saying that the sale of cannabis should not be legalized and it's a public health concern. Who will we listen to this time? And that really is the choice. Again, there's no neutrals. You're either on the side of the people who want to make a lot of money from pot and who deny the science, and that's fine, or you're on the side of the AMA and other scientific and medical organizations um, who see this for what it is, a major threat to public health. And again, we are living in a time where we might be able to stop it. The question is, will we get up and do that? Um, because we don't have, there's no second chances. You know, if it's legal, it's, I think it will be irreversible because alcohol and tobacco are irreversible. I've worked in Washington in three administrations. Good luck dealing with the alcohol industry, with the lobbyists. They have six lobbyists for every member of Congress. <laughs> and, and by the way, don't think tobacco is like, you know, it's poor little, they've kind of gone down. No, they're making more money than ever. Why? They're recycling these ads in West Africa and Southeast Asia right now and making billions. As if those regions need something else. Um, so don't worry, these industries are here and they're here to stay. I don't want to create another industry. It doesn't mean I like black market violence. It doesn't mean I like gang violence. We got to figure out, and we are doing things to curb those things. There are innovative ways to work to reduce that. But I'll say, I'll take an underground market for marijuana, which by the way is mainly nonviolent. In other words, the average transaction of marijuana in this country is not done on a shady, with a shady character on a street corner with a gun. Let's be very honest about how kids get pot. They usually get it from a family member, a friend, grows themselves. I mean, it's not the cocaine market, okay? So I still don't think it's ideal. We, don't, we want to reduce that market. But this scares me more, actually, than the status quo when it comes to the market. And finally, this is Colorado. I mean, I think we need to think about, you know, this thing is, this is about an experiment we always, we're always hearing. An experiment on our kids? I mean, that's who we're using as our science experiment right now. Surrounded by all this stuff, Captain Chronic. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Um, so we really need to think about where we're going. So um, I don't know there's a qu wonderful quote but that Nelson Mandela gave before his death actually about cannabis and other drugs, which you can read on your own. Um, but I, I definitely want to thank you all for having me today. It was, a, it was really um, wonderful for me to be able to address you. Um, I think we might have like a time for one or two questions, uh, Doug, I think, because I, think, I think our, our end game is probably like 10, 20, 30. I know you, you probably have something else going on, so we need to leave, but maybe we can do one or two questions if that's okay. But I just want to thank you first for, for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.